Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Williams. This is the progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, conservative, or otherwise, you get to air your point of view. Remember, you can also send me a tweet to E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S, that is, at Egberto Willie. Let us engage. It is politics done right. One, two, three, four. Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Radamic. Right. Berto is your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. We are going to have a great show for you today. It's a two. It's a twofer as usual. It's a twofer, and it's sort of a yet another twofer because coming in from North Carolina, we also have a twofer. So, what are we going to talk about today? I want to go ahead and get started quickly because there's a hell of a lot to discuss. We have to discuss this stuff about environmental justice first, but then we have to also hit on. Venezuela, lo que está pasando en Venezuela. We are going to really take you home there and make sure to give you the real story and not the false story. I am going to be uh, interviewing the ambassador of Colombia. Uh, he's going to be talking about Venezuela tomorrow. I want to see how that is going to jibe with what we are going to talk about today with my thoughts on Venezuela as well. So anyhow, what's the title of the program today? It is... Is Trump using Venezuela for political gain? Numero uno. Number two will be about environmental justice. Subtitle, I have seen this Venezuela playbook before. The only difference is that this time it was designed to cripple Democrats if they allow it to succeed. It is deceptive and putting it bluntly, murderous. Every other Wednesday, Tamara Sheely from Tamara for Georgia is with us to discuss not only issues in Georgia, but how that now purple state, and notice I said purple state on the verge of becoming a blue state, is a reflection of what is happening in America today. Today she visits with us from the Citizen Science Conference in Raleigh, North Carolina, along with Vincent Morton, an environmental justice advocate. The second part of the show covers Venezuela. It is imperative that we look at this situation with wide open eyes. We must not be hoodwinked into another war or pseudo war on false pretenses to prop up a false democratic socialism narrative, to deflect from the doings of a president who has given away the store to the plutocrats and to continue robbing the resources of a mineral rich country. We will discuss in more detail. But without further ado, I bring you Tamara Sheely and Vincent Morton. How are you guys doing back there in North Carolina? Hey, Egberto. Hey, Egberto. Hello. Hey, hello. Look, guys, um, thank you guys for being out there uh, talking about economic, I mean, uh, uh, environmental justice. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with Tamara. Tamara. Uh, tell us what you are doing. You're spending a hell of a lot of time on the road these days. You're in North Carolina. The other day you were in Tennessee. God knows where you're going to end up next. What are you doing out there in uh, in North Carolina now? Hey, Egberto. So, yes, uh, I'm on the road right now looking for, you know, getting to know these other communities and making some connections. You know, I'm with the beauty and barber industry. We address policy. If you can see my T-shirt, Egberto, I don't think you've ever seen it. Politics, beauty, and barber. We address policy that affects the beauty and barber industry. So, you know, there's a lot of health and safety issues that are plaguing our industry. We're, we're being threatened with deregulation. So we're making the connections to, to bring science and, and more truth and more facts uh, about our industry. So I'm here in North Carolina at the Citizen Scientists Association, their annual event. Now, what is that all uh, about? Yeah, go ahead, uh, uh, Vincent. Well, um, I'm Vincent Martin. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. Uh, and one of the issues that, that I'm here for is because I'm an advocate for community. Because uh, we always have all these grass tops that always bring all these programs for communities. But usually when that happens, the grass top absorb all the resources and the community end up getting the crumbs. So I'm always out there pushing for how community can get more bang for the book on what's supposed to be done because it's our dollars being spent here and citizen science has been a mechanism where we use data 
that's out there and how we can use data to leverage policy and uh, uh, policy change and, and affect you know, decisions from our politicians. Now, uh, Vincent, you said you used a word that I wasn't familiar with. Uh, what uh, green? Some what, what was that? Um, green top or something like that? You said Gra grass tops. That's mean all these uh, so-called environmental agencies that want uh -huh. to, they like to come here and they like to speak for communities. They want to come here and take the place of the community and provide the services and write the grants and get. And then once you get once they get the resources, mm -hmm. usually uh, they absorb most of the resources in, in the community that needs to help don't really get the services that, that they actually are, the money is, is issued to. So, and this happens time and time and time again. So that, we're that actually, is why. you know, go ahead, ahead. Go ahead. and I'm here also to, you know, to interject how we could provide community oversight in this process with our government. You know, it's time we've done it their way for so long and, I came up with the idea of how we could create a community commission to provide oversight in our government. I mean, it's our dollars that we're that we're going to be overseeing. So why should we see? I mean, it will guarantee transparency. It will guarantee equity and, and accountability. If the community was had a you know a hands on what's going on, how it's been, and we have the right to say no to all this crazy spending. I mean, it's crazy that we had one person decide to shut down a government for 35 days. I mean, that's, who ever heard of something like that? Yeah, so, I know Tamara I mean, for a long, for the longest time, she was uh, sort of uh, uh, concerned about the 35 uh, days shut down. And now we find out that uh, it probably affected the air crash that we had uh, just recently because it stopped for five weeks the, 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 the changes in the software that would have mitigated that problem. Now, Tamara, uh, I know you're, you are there for several reasons. Um, I, what I'd like you to do first for me is explain to me what is this. I mean, I understand what Vincent had to say. What is this conference as, uh, to you? What does this conference mean to you and why should we be promoting it or talking about it here on national on a national network? Well, for me, it's 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 an opportunity to learn. Um, there's a lot happening, like specific to my industry and a lot of my efforts with the beauty and barber industry. Um, we don't know what we don't know. And we need support uh, from the science community to address, like I said, the health and safety concerns that we have in our industry. You know, we use chemicals. We're, you know, not only are we have, you know, air pollution in our salons and barbershops with all the overexposure and all the, the, the things we're misting and spraying and blow drying and flat iron and it's like uh, the air quality in our salons people are getting asthma they're getting sick um so many health conditions are happening inside of our salons and barbershops to people that are providing these services day in and day out so we need to address our industry um with some data and some some science and we need to show that you know people are really getting sick based on chemical exposure you know we we we're, we're washing hair and shampooing hair and we're putting chemicals in the water like we we are an environmental issue so we're just really trying to connect with, with this community to figure out where we can work together and this community is the environmental justice community so tell me a little bit uh, tell me a little bit more about this what i'm trying to gather here is uh first of all is this an independent association is this a ngo what is this well, it's actually a, a collaborative of different groups and organizations that are doing environmental justice work nationally around the world. And academia has taken an interest on, you know, how they can use the data that we collect, you know, and coming from a community perspective to push this out instead of them coming in and, you know, just giving us the information that they want us to go. Because they get a lot of pushback because a lot of our communities, you know, the geniuses is in the neighborhood. We know where mm -hmm. everything is at, what's needed, everything. We don't need to come and assess because we already know. Mm -hmm. So by us teaming together, we're here showing that, you know, that the community can actually pull this off and do this. I mean, we just, we got 875 representatives from all over the country here, all over the world here at this event, which is, you know. How many? They didn't, 875 people. We didn't wow. up two hotels. Great. You know, so it's, 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 you know, today's the first day we just went on a toxic tour and, and, and just because I come from an environmental justice community where I live, 
we have 29 heavy industrial facilities surrounding a neighborhood, you know, and the problem is, is we don't know exactly what all these chemicals are doing when they go into the air and they mingle. We got monitors around that's supposed to be, you know, checking for certain chemicals, but once these chemicals mingle, it becomes something else. So now it's cloaked from the monitor. So we're getting data that's not, that's not actual. You know, it's you know, not I, actual data. Let me tell you what I found fascinating in just a little bit part of the discussion that we had here, both with what you're talking about. You, you mentioned about all those several industries that surround your community and what it is doing to the community. And then we have Tamara talking about being inside of a beauty salon uh, with a whole lot of chemicals that affect people. I see, first of all, the commonality is uh, none of you guys who, uh, nobody in that, uh, inside of that, uh, not healthcare, but that hair salon makes any of those chemicals. And as far as you're concerned, Vincent, nobody that has all those factors and nobody that lives under the purview of all those factories know what the hell is inside of those factories. So we, it, it, a lot of the programming that I do, a lot of the, the, the advocacy, a lot of the, 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 the uh, activism that I do has to do with what corporate what cor the corporate state or the corporations are doing to people. I love that both of you have two different directions that you're coming from. She's internal, you are external. It's, I would have never thought, and I, I, you know, until she brought up the environment inside of a beauty salon. I would have never looked at it that way. You go to a salon, you think everything is okay. So Tamara, tell all these people who are, first I was going to say women, but I mean, that is sexist because both women and men go to view the salons now, as I understand it. What, you know, uh, tell us a little bit more about environment inside of a beauty salon and why people need to really take this seriously. Um, and specifically, let's say in, in uh, a cultural not a salons, meaning black and others that use these even more chemicals than the others. Mm -hmm. So there's there's this one service that's really popular. It's like called the Brazilian blowout, Egbert. So you know nothing about it. You have no, no hair, so you would yeah you wouldn't know anything <laughs> Thank about you. it. So people get this. I know people get their hair straight and like bone straight. So it's like this look, right? Mm -hmm. But that with if, with that service, when they press the hair, when when heat is applied to the chemicals that are that is that's on the hair, it releases formaldehyde into the air. So it's oh, like a really? lot of Yes, and it's very dangerous. Um, a lot of professionals have chosen not to do it, but there's still a lot of people that are still providing this service, and it comes in different forms. There's, you know, some products that don't call it a Brazilian blowout, but it gives that same straight effect to the hair, and it's still releasing um, harmful chemicals into the air. That's just one service. One thing that we've uncovered just recently, and it's Egbert, so this may become a conversation later for us, is hair weaving. Like a lot of your salons now, you can go in and you get your hair weave. The hair is actually braided to the scalp, but when the hair is braided, they use a needle. Now this needle is, is just like a threading needle and they use they, they put the thread on the end of it and, and literally thread the hair or sew the hair into the hair on top of the braided hair. But that needle is just, it looks like a safety pin with a hook on it. And that can poke, scrape, stick, and puncture the scalp which not only can you be cross-contaminating because we're not cleaning these needles, you, you can be, you can be cross-contaminating by using these needles on, on different people over and over all day. Or you could, if you stick yourself as a professional, you're cross-contaminating with your client. So it's, right. it's so many da hidden dangers inside of our salons and barbershops. That's just a couple examples. Like I say, the spritz, the sprays, the hair, the hair sprays, the flat ironing, all the things that we're doing we're adding all these combinations of, of products and putting these chemicals into the air and into our breathing zone. I mean, we have technicians, you know, professionals that have asthma, um, just all kind of breathing, you know, all kinds of issues with their health, fibroids in women. It's so many issues that we want to address in our salons and barbershops. I, I think it. I think that is important, and I think something else is important. Uh, well, not something else. That what you're talking about is important, but I think women who. Uh, Put, who are in sal or with people who are in salons all of the times have to be cognizant of what you're talking about that yes in fact this can be a danger zone just like we have uh, some of, I'm going to talk to Vincent about that just like he he probably lives in a danger zone and I, 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 I in fact here's what I want to do Vincent because 
Uh, when, when Tamara said she was going to be uh, talking from North Carolina at this conference and she mentioned the word social uh, or environmental injustice, that really uh, kind of touched uh, me as saying, this is something that I, I want to hear uh, within your community itself. What have you noticed why you're calling it environmental injustice? And what kind of a demographics are we talking about that generally get affected by such? Well, nationally in the United States, um, communities of color are the ones that are mostly affected because usually all these uh, heavy industries are hosted in their communities. So um, from that, we see an uptick in respiratory illnesses and different cancers these type of issues that are affecting their lives and their quality of life. Now, the, the, the injustice is, is that, you know, we are all supposed to be under a constitution that's supposed to protect us, you know, equal protection under the law. So are these industries have, uh, and our government has allowed these industries to strive and just negate people's rights to be, have equal protection because they're not protecting the rights to clean air the right to breathe, the right to, to have a, quality, a good quality of life that your taxes pay for. So that's where the injustice is. And also the injustice on our kids, because it, it, in urban communities, if you notice, all the freeways are usually real close to us, uh, to schools. And the effect of diesel emission, gasoline emissions, and things like that affects cognitive learning. When you start affecting cognitive learning, you stop brain development. And so we have a lot of these kids that walk around here that they say they have these reading problems or the HD, you know, the ADHD and all this stuff. No, they have actually been poisoned and have you know you put all these things that are stop stopping the neurons from actually processing and moving faster than they have because you have created these barriers with this poison in their system. So that's where the injustice is. And again, these places are never put into no white affluent community is always in the poor community of colors and we're usually <clears throat> um, their voices shudder. I mean in Detroit they came up with an emergency manager's law that completely took away the, the voting rights of I mean, we yeah they we took over your council the, yeah the, our council our government our whole I mean our, everything they took away everything I mean and we outvoted under a referendum the emergency manager's law and they turned around Within two weeks, you know how long it takes for them to create law. Oh, I, oh absolutely. Weeks, they rewrote a new law and they attached it to an appropriation bill so it could not be recalled again. And I saw they that. forced it. You know, and that's the same thing they was going to do to Puerto Rico before the hurricane hit them. Let's not even get into Puerto Rico quite yet, but that's that's a very okay. that's a very touchy subject. But let me tell you, I, I want to take go on a, on a little a, sh, a very short rant here because uh, you guys are calling it now. This is a uh, uh, environmental injustice. I also call this an economic injustice because if in effect you have these uh, these salons, if in effect you have these heavy industries in these particular communities there are two economic disadvantages right there right one yes. their property values are already depressed because of the presence of those uh, those so you have already damaged that community uh, from further econ from a, a larger sense of economic development but secondly given that these industries are polluting industries it also means that the healthcare cost for people in these environments are actually higher. So you are rich, you live in a more affluent community, you make more money and you have less healthcare costs, you are poor, you have less money, and what is higher? Your healthcare costs and your values of properties are lower. So uh, I am happy that you guys are out there fighting the fight for, well, I shouldn't say fighting the fight, ensuring that people understand that because there are a lot of good the fact that you have a conference like you are attending right now mean that there are some good people with a heart who may have no knowledge of what you guys know and you guys are there to present the full picture like i learned if 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 tamara didn't mention about the environment in, in a salon i would have never thought about that if you didn't if you know if you didn't tell me about i mean 
that is how learning occurs. And I'm glad that you guys are there. I mean, I also learned about grass top today. I didn't, didn't know that word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did I say it right? Gra is it grass top? The grass top. <laughs> hey, the guys. Grass you see absorb all the, all the resources. Hey, you know why I talk... Resources. You know, I like to talk to a lot of people, man, because I'm like a sponge. Now I'm going to remember grass top for a long time. A brother from <laughs> Detroit taught me a, a, new, a new word to add to my repertoire. But anyhow, so um, we, we talked. I said... Uh, we don't. I don't want to bring in Puerto Rico here. And the reason I don't want to bring in Puerto Rico is we show how evil uh, a, a, a government, pres a president we have when it comes to that. And that's another subject. But what I, I like to be outcome based, right? I like to know that, you know, it's very easy to complain. It's very easy for both of you to go out there and just talk about all the things that are going wrong. In the case of Tamara, the industry. In the case, I mean, uh, the inside of a inside of a. Uh, a salon, and a case in your case, what's happening with heavy industries around your community? Uh, I would hope that in a, that you are able to present something to these guys, and these guys are are, are are as far as what solutions would you want to come out of what you're doing right now out there? What would you like to be? Well, these are the issues. These are the problems. Now, what concrete solutions can you give these folks that they can add to their body of knowledge to do to solve the problem? Well, for us, uh, like I said, we're here to make the connections. There needs to be more research and more uh, in, in our salons and barbershops. We need, we need air monitoring. We need surface samples. Like we need to really go in and collect data. We need to find out what's happening with people's health. Like there definitely needs to be a lot of research in, in our industry. So I'm hopeful and to Tamara, make those connections. And Tamara, who do you want uh, who do you want doing that research? Is that something that you want the government to establish something to do or is that some, what do you want? Or do you want the, want, the companies? No, I want the professionals to be a part. I want to understand more about what it means to be a citizen scientist. And I want us to do our own our own gathering of data and research. But we need help in facilitating that process. So I'm hopeful to make the connections that will help us as beauty and barber professionals to gather our own data and our own information. We don't want any inner, anybody else coming in doing this for us. This is something we can totally do for ourselves. The same with him and his community. It's like knowing that the, you, these are the activists. These are the people on the ground. They know about what's more about what's happening in the community than some outsiders coming in. And then, Vincent, in that regard, uh, the outsiders, you, you will need some help from the outsiders coming in, I imagine, for the technical skills that would be needed for, I mean, uh, you know, chemical-based issues and that sort of thing, right? Well, you know, out of necessity, we learned how to, you know, do our, own, you know, like we learned how to, how to catch our own uh, air to go get it sampled and tested, we, you know, we, out of necessity, so we can't always depend on, on, on them to come to the rescue. Flint, Michigan you know, taught so we, us that, didn't it? Right, mm -hmm. right. I mean, if, yeah, and I was one of the first people to go out there and advocate. To, I told the EPA to themselves, say, I need to call yourselves the EPNA. They say, what's, what's that? The Environmental Protection Not Agency. <laughs> because, you know, because you know, they're, not, they're not protecting. And I do have a solution. I'm saying we need to uh, create a community agency. And we can easily do that because the government has all these agencies that's supposed to improve the quality of life, and they get all this big budget money, reduce each agency by 20%. We put it into a, 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 a system where we could create a community uh, co a commission that uh, will be sitting there providing oversight over our spending, over our jails, or I mean, com the community to be part of the conversation, period. Because, you know, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, and we need like to stop that, that practice. Right. You know, that practice has to stop. We need to be part of the conversation from the beginning, the middle, and the end. and need to become part of the solution. And again, all this misspending, all this, you know, we can bring accountability to government spending in America if the community was part of the conversation. Well, what is interesting is there's a whole lot of spending. That, uh, they will try to give you, uh, uh, the government would try, the government under these administrations, and they go both ways, uh, will try to limit how much money they'll give to the community. But it's always, uh, we never have those particular issues when we are giving subsidies to corporations and that sort of thing, right? Uh, look at what's happening now. Uh, Donald Trump is getting $500 million or applied for $500 million to help 
create a democracy in Venezuela. Ah. Uh, Imagine that. I mean, uh, you know, so uh, I, I, I don't know if you guys going to be able to stick around, but later on, uh, you should check out what I'm going to talk about, Venezuela equating it to what, what, what Bush did in Panama. So it's going to be an interesting show uh, at the second point. So uh, let me ask you guys to do two things for me. I, I'm, first of all, I'm happy to hear that you, were act, that you actually have a solution. In other words, you have some wants and some demands that you would like to make. Now, do you have corresponding politicians who can be the carriers of those demands that you're asking for? Well, I was asked to represent community on this Green New Deal issue by the Cory Booker administration, the Bernie Sanders administration, and, and the EPA. <clears throat> so, but, but the first thing I told them, you know, is that, okay, we could do this new Green Deal, um, but we're going to have to put a change to it because if the community is not part of the conversation, there's no deal with the new green deal. We have let me to stop you there. Let me this. let me stop you right there. That is one of the one that is one of the great things about the Green New Deal. It takes into consideration economic justice and all these other issues. It doesn't just say we're going environmentally friendly and we're going to build windmills and all of that. It takes the system systemic problem that we have in this in this country with communities of color with uh, underserved communities like in Appalachia and those other places where all these great ideas come about i mean if you take a look at all the think tanks or you take a look at even some of our more progressive organizations where are they mostly hosted again in dc when was the last time you saw them in your community again so i mean uh, uh having you there vincent having you there tamara folks that are living in the community, come out there and, uh, and be a part of, that is what has to be done. And I think more activists have, more activists have to push themselves in the debate because you don't, have, you don't always sit back and ask to be a part of it. You demand to be a part of it. And if, you, if your demands are not meant, you infiltrate to be a part of it, won't you say? And, and, and another issue is the, the elephant in the room that they don't want to talk about, the environmental racism that comes from, you know, these decisions. I mean, like I say, it's not by it's not by chance that that our community are hosting all these. I mean, I'm personally, I think it's germ warfare on people of color. You know, they, our numbers are growing. If we combine each other, we're going to become the majority within the next 10 years. And, you know, the power is going to be a power shift. So what they've done, they start putting these poisons out and they cut, they're killing us by a thousand cuts by putting these, these industries in our community poisoning us every day. So, I mean, we got to call a spade a spade when it's a spade. Well, there, there, are, a lot of, there are a lot of other things that get, that's getting done. I mean, if you take a look at it, and, and I, we did a, a thing with Move to Amend where we spoke about um, – uh, how do you make a democracy not a democracy? And what we're doing now, if you take a look at what Donald Trump is doing, it starts with the Supreme Court and then it continues with the courts all over the country. The only undemocratic portion of this country, technically speaking, is the, is the judicial system, right? Because one, uh, uh, five persons in the Supreme Court can strike a law down and, and trying to reverse that is next to impossible through popular means. So, I mean, you're correct about their, their I like the phrase that you use, uh, killing you by a thousand cuts or bleeding you to death by a thousand cuts. You know, we, 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 we make a whole lot of the community very unintelligent. And I, I want to... I, I tell you something, uh, Vincent and Tamara, I want to start creating better allies. And what I mean by that is um, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, what you speak about, I think you're implying a whole lot about white supremacy. White supremacy ain't all that advantageous to white people at all. And to my white audience, I like to tell, I, I speak to that all of the times. Actually, most of my audience is, in fact, white. And what I tell tell them all of the times is whenever you hear us talking about issues like white supremacy and these other things remember white supremacy is not for white people white supremacy is for a select few people and they use the supremacy portion of, of, uh, of, of it to have the white people it's not for protect those on the top we have to understand the politics and we have to understand the mechanics the masses are the same. We create friction between the masses for another good. And by what you guys are doing, you all are hitting a portion of that. And I want to thank you guys for doing that. 
Oh, no problem. Yes, yes. absolutely, Egberto. <laughs> yes. But, you know, so give me uh, first, uh, uh, Vincent, give me a little closing statement because we got to get out of here. I got to I gotta get to Venezuela, hermano. So give me a little closer, brother. Well, again, the community has to be at the table from the beginning, the middle, the end. And we need to provide the oversight because they're using our dollars anyway to pay for everything. So why not us overlooking our spending? Excellent. Tamara? All right, so Egberto, I just want to thank you for having us on your broadcast. broadcast. Yes, sir. And, and thank you for uh, every every other Wednesday having me on. I'm out here fighting the good fight. I know um, I talk a lot about, this, you know, Georgia and everything that's happening, but I'm really working uh, on a bigger scale with the beauty and barber industry. Most people get their hair cut or get their nails done or get facials, get lashes. It's all kind of, you know, beauty and barber services that people are getting. And I'm out here fighting to make sure that people are safe in those environments. Well, uh, look, both of you, uh, Vincent, thank you so kindly for being here. Tamaras, thank you so kindly. From the time I met you in, I think it was Arizona, I knew that, that there's a whole, I mean, there. Uh, Vincent, you, you're working with a good a, a good person there who is really a tough activist. So uh, you're in good company. And, and based on, I've just met you, Vincent, and l just listening to you, uh, I'm, I would be happy to have you have my back. So both of you, keep up the good work. Thank you for what you guys are doing out there. And c'est la vie, those folks. That was Tamara Shealy, who was pre who previously ran for state senate in Georgia. Should have been the state senator, but we won't go there. And we have El Senor Vincent Martin. Thank you so kindly for being here. You know what I should have done before Vincent, uh, but we'll talk some other time. I need to make yes. uh, I need to make uh, 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 what you call uh, what you those call those not, not an ad but a, a advocacy sort of like an ad for the Latino community about what's occurring in those communities as far as these industries are concerned. Sometime we'll hook up and do that. So look, thank you guys. You have a wonderful time and have fun over there in North Carolina for both me and everybody else because it's beautiful out there. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Egberto. Bye-bye. Folks, that was Tamara and Vincent. We are going to have a great continuation of this show. Look, we are talking about now Venezuela. I am going to sort of get in trouble with some friends of mine when we talk about Venezuela because a lot of friends don't take the position that I, that I take on Venezuela. And before I get in, I want to say, say this. I am always... I, I, let me, let me put it this way. I think Nicolas Maduro is horrendous. I think he's bad for the country. I think Nicolas Maduro is probably ripping the country off as well as many others. What I do know, however, is the Venezuelan plutocracy has been doing that all along and, in a, and that Maduro is taking some of these profits, if you will, for himself, that others have done the same, the one saving grace that I have seen for many of these folks is at least some have remembered that there are people in the underclass for which all that wealth of the country, which is a lot, had gone to for a while. But when you have a plutocracy with the help of superpowers undermining the entire economy that hurts people... I think it is murderous. I think it is evil. But what I'm going to do is first start our program with the blog of the week. And for those of you who disagree with me, please feel free to call in. Right now we're having some issues. It seems like Facebook is down. Uh, Facebook has been down for some time now. So this is probably going to be broadcast. I don't think, uh, let me see if they, they, they are trans. According to this, it is sending data to Facebook, but I don't know if Facebook is alive or not. Let me go ahead and take a look. But I think uh, Facebook has been down now for some time. Uh, but we have YouTube Live that's going strong and, and Periscope that's going strong. And uh, Twitch, that's still going strong as well. So here's what I want to do, however. I want to talk about this. And what I want to ask you to do is listen with the spirit with which I am talking about this particular issue and understand where I'm coming from. So folks, guess 
what? Do you know, again I repeat, do you know what time it is? It's time for the weekly blog post. Okay, a telephone caller, I'll get to you right after the blog of the week. And I'll come to you right after the blog of the week. I need to get this one out. So the blog of the week today is titled, Preparing for War in Venezuela? Question mark. I've seen this play before. And here it goes. Too many times. Too many times our mainstream media reacts after the fact. Venezuela is not new news. It is convenient new, or rather, it is convenient new both politically and economically for the Trump and those intent on stealing the natural resources of third world countries. The Venezuela story serves two purposes that feed off of each other. With the advent of millennials and other Americans realizing that the current econ economy is extractive on most, please see my piece on price and power, it is imperative that they jolt you back to the Powell Manifesto's indoctrination, which programs you to believe that the type of economy we have is best for everyone. Forget what your eyes and your finances are telling you. That's what they want. Forget what your eyes and your finances are telling you. Let's be clear. Venezuela is a basket case because of Maduro, but also because of the Venezuelan plutocracy and the United States. Here is what I mean. The United States could not allow a non-European democratic socialist state that is sitting on a fortune of natural resources capable of educating its masses who were left behind by the wealthy few and their wards. They couldn't do that. It's too close to home. America is awash in natural resources on federal land and on stolen land. Suppose our masses got educated after realizing that their southern neighbor was successful at doing it. We can make excuses for those Scandinavian countries. After all, they're mostly monolithic, right? So if that, that democratic, uh, that, it's a, that their democratic socialist state is special for them. In as much as they're happier than us from every poll done. In as much as they live longer, as any poll, every poll says. In as much as these people have health care. In as much as these people have support for their kids. In all these great features these people have. And they live and they have free enterprise. And if you want to form a company, you can form a company and profit from your company. All these great things. The only thing is that you cannot have the corporations pilfering the people, right? But it's okay to just keep, those, keep that quiet. Don't tell anybody about it. But if we get a South American country attempting to do that, it's the end of the world. We have to make an example because guess what? Americans may wake up. And Americans may see, oh my God, why is it on? Well, we'll go there in a little bit. We'll go there in a little bit. America is awash in natural resources on federal land. We know that. So with the help of the Venezuelan plutocracy who have been robbing the country for decades, Trump and Obama as, as well, they're stooge who would carry the mantra of what, the, rather, they want to make this a stooge of who's carrying the democratic socialism, the democratic socialism does to an economy. They want to carry a mantra. They want that to be the mantra. They want Venezuela to be that mantra that represents democratic socialism because they wouldn't want Americans to hear the truth. Forget that for the first time they started eradicating that, that democratic socialist state under Hugo Chavez started eradicating poverty in Venezuela. But you must not know that. We must not tell you the truth. We must try to paint the truth in such a manner to constantly make it evil. And then we have a lot of even good Venezuelan people, good middle-class Venezuelan people who don't realize that they were adapted, they were chosen by the system so that they would be the promoters of a system that really has always been bad. But they don't know it because they live in their region, their bubble, that tells them this stuff works. 
you will not hear this from news outlets wedded to our system. So now, the United States is getting ready for a pseudo-war in Venezuela, likely to end like the one in Panama, where the U.S. military killed thousands of Panamanians, purportedly to arrest Manuel Antonio Noriega for his capitalist need to supply drugs that hurt many Americans, no different than what our pharmaceutical companies do today. You see, it depends on who is causing the death of Americans that matter. U.S. corporations directly, hey, it's okay. It's okay that 100 people are dying every single day in America because of an opioid crisis created by legal drug companies giving legal drugs. But somebody selling marijuana gets locked up because they're selling something so evil that it doesn't kill you. But they get locked up. The corporations don't, and they're murdering people left and right, and they know it. Others less so, not so good. The blackouts in Venezuela are likely caused by U.S. cyber sabotage. Telesur had an interesting piece titled, Venezuela Blackouts Straight from Cyber War Playbook. And this is what it said. According to the author, modern cyber warfare is the first step in an overall intervention and has the intent of weakening the enemy by creating chaos or sowing social disaffection. This could eventually be followed by a more conventional type of warfare, including invasion. The author posits... In the case of Venezuela, the idea of a government like the United States remotely interfering with its power grid is actually quite realistic. Remote cyber operations rarely require a significant ground presence, making them the ideal deniable influence operation. Being a com close quote, being a complete Deniable action, it can also be used to blame your enemies, putting more pressure on them within their populations. One example of this is that three minutes, three minutes after the start of the blackout, United States Senator Marco Rubio tweeted a message to his followers casting blame on the Nicolás Maduro administration. The quick nature of the tweet gave the appearance of a coordinated attack which caused the Venezuelan vice president, Delcy Rodriguez, to call Rubio out by name on social networks. Finally, Litaru says, widespread power and connectivity outages like the one in Venezuela experienced last week are also straight from the modern cyber playbook. The cyber attack began Thursday against the El Guri hydroelectric plant control system and left Venezuela, the Venezuelan population, without electricity for almost 24 hours. According to the Venezuelan government, this nationwide blackout was brought about by foreign blackout actions aimed at destabilizing the government of President uh, Nicolas Maduro, who stressed that the aggression affected everyone equally without political distinction. If that is the case, our policies are already killing Venezuelans just like we did Panamanians leading up to and after Bush invaded Panama in 1989. Do not be surprised if we keep Venezuela in dire straits and invade close to the 2020 elections. And all during the election, we use them as the poster child for democratic socialism. What the Democrats intend to bring you, that is what they will say. How many news outlets are highlighting the fact that Trump is asking for half a billion dollars for actions in Venezuela? He has asked for half a billion dollars for Venezuela, for actions in Venezuela. And the video is in the, in the blog post. The, playbooks is, the playbook is out of those who are, or rather, the playbook is out for those who are interested in seeing it. Just like the Bush administration destroyed the Panamanian economy before and it, before and it invaded when the country failed to tur uh, turn on Noriega, that same outcome is a distinct possibility in Venezuela. The alternative independent sources of information enlighten Americans with truth. Spread the word. Share the truth. I have a whole lot of typos in there. This We are using a new WordPress, uh, the block editor, 
And even as you correct them, sometimes it just reverts to the old thing. So there's going to be some corrections into that blog that we have to do. But folks, uh, the telephone number, you know what it is. It is 646-716-5812, 646-716-5812. Let me go to the line. I think I have my friend from Singapore. Come on in. I think this is Mike from Singapore. Yes, sir, my friend. Come on Alberto in, sir. Uh, Come on in. No, 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 no mucho, estoy aquí. Yes. <laughs> si, si, comprendes. Fabulous. You know, uh, did Pentagon recycle Nitro Zeos to take down the Venezuela power grid, pushing board closer to World War Three? Uh, and uh, regarding that, is it was around... Uh, you know, before uh, uh, elections time, uh, they have uh, developed a cyber uh, security department in Pentagon that it can bring down Iran's, uh, you know, Absolutely. electric grid Absolutely. down. Absolutely. Yeah, so what, what happened... The code name is Nitro Zeus. So since they, you know, still everything is limbo. So they said, let us use it on Venezuela. Right. So Venezuelan people are dying in the hospital. Venezuelan, they don't have a water. They, uh, I mean, uh, uh, basically it's a total purge, like the movie. Let it's me, happening right now let in me tell our you, eyes in Venezuela. Mike, let me tell you something. Okay, during 1989, I, I don't remember if it was a stealth, but I think it was a stealth fighter that they were testing. Panama has no Air Force. Panama has no Marine or anything like that. I understand that they were using, the, they were testing the stealth fighters in Panama. Think about that. On you know hitting the quince piso, that's a 15-story floor, the highest building in Panama City, in in, in Colón, the city that I'm from. Then, uh, so so it, this is not uncommon for for us to try a whole lot of things on these third-world countries. They use a C-130 to decimate certain parts of Panama City. I mean, you you name it, and I'm I'm you know one of the. I, I w one of the things that concerns me the most is we've seen this playbook before. In other words, and the thing about it is, I can't blame American, the average American citizen, for not knowing this. If I didn't uh, find that article in Telesur, which is a newspaper that you can find online, but most Americans are not reading Telesur. Most Americans are not reading these Latin American uh, papers, even though many of the Latin American papers also print in English. But we just consider the New York Times, the Washington Post, and all these rags that may send somebody down there to at a at a at a at a, at a protest a simulated protest i don't know if if you're watching this on youtube what you'll see behind me is a well designed protest and it says in in the back of it Apag apagaron uh, Venezuela, meaning they turned out, what they wanted to say is they turned out the lights in Venezuela, right? But this is such a well-designed poster. People that are starving and are economically disadvantaged cannot afford those types of posters and all those flags. What you find is an elitist group that is funded by outsiders and the plutocracy that, that have the money to invest in these very big protests. I, I was sitting in, in Starbucks today, and one of the guys looked at me, and he said, you know what's so interesting, Egberto? I, uh, I was looking at all those uh, things today, and what I found out is that, or what I see from all the protests that I'm watching, is I'm watching all these people seem like they're having fun, to which I told him, they are having fun. You know, they are really having fun. They want, you know, what's going on in, in Venezuela is not unlike what goes on in most of Central America and South America, where you have a strong plutocracy. When Hugo Chavez came, he came out there for a reason. You can't have a country sitting on an ocean of oil with most of the people poor and a small class of people 
who benefit from it. But before I go any further, let me do a quick pitch for my um, for subscriptions, and then I'll come right back to you, Mike. Of folks, course, of course. Folks, this is Politics Done Right. My name is Egberto Willis. I'd like to ask you so kindly to please become subscribers of Politics Done Right. We bring you all kinds of stories. We bring you it from directions that you won't get from the mainstream media. We are honest, and we tell you our sources, and we are not, look, it is in no, nobody's benefit. It is not in an independent journalist and independent bloggers benefit to misinform you. My goal is to earn your trust. I'm not asking you to take things that I say at face value. I am imploring you to research even, I mean, there's there may be a time when you develop trust in what I'm saying and you'll say, okay, I'll definitely take when I'm too lazy or when I don't want to go, I'll take things at face value. Know that I'm working hard to be as honest as I can with you, with the, with the messages that I bring you. But you know what? We do need support at Politics Done Right. We do need support to be able to pay the bills. We do need support to be able to, uh, I mean, if you take a look at the amount of videos and all those things that we put out there, the amount of processing that goes into it, it's a lot. And for that, we need to have subscribers. We need thousands of subscribers and we're just beginning. So please go to patreon.com slash politics done right. That is P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash politics done right. Our subscriptions are very inexpensive. They start at $1.99. I mean, if you don't want to give us subscriptions and you just want to go ahead and say, I want to support your program by giving you a, 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 a contribution, please go to uh, politicsdoneright.com. That is politicsdoneright, all one word, dot com. And you can go to our PayPal uh, screen or, or even the Patreon screen. Again, go to patreon.com com slash politics done right and please support the program as a token of appreciation uh, we are providing to you uh, the book that I'm currently writing how to make America utopia the book is uh, I have the first two chapters written and online those of you who subscribe have immediate access to the book online I'm currently writing the third chapter of the book when that is released it'll be online as well and of course when the book is complete you get any copy of the book as well all our books are available online for you to peruse as a as subscribers. You can go ahead and go to patreon.com slash politics and write to see how to do that. Now, the other book that we have is As I See It, Class Warfare, The Only Resort to Right-Wing Doom. That book is, if you want to learn about the economy, how it is that they're screwing us and how we can mitigate that. I don't believe in just talking about problems. I believe in having solutions to problems. So if you want to learn about how it works from patents, all these things in a very easy to understand way, please go to as go to uh, patreon.com slash politics done right. Subscribe to our network. As I see it, Class Warfare is the book that tells you that. You can also get that book at Amazon, of course. As I see it, Class Warfare, the only resort to right-wing doom. Would love for you to do subscribe and have access to all our books. And as you know, um, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm an activist and I've had battles of the bulges and I decided, you know what, I found a way to lose weight and it wasn't using snake oil or anything like that. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about my story of losing 50 pounds and staying fit and why I will be staying fit going forward, mostly also for health reason. So I wrote this book, Lose Weight and Be Fit Now, Say No to Snake Oil. And, uh, you know, even activists have to worry about their health. Even activists have to make sure and stay healthy. If we want to help the people and protect the folks and, and do that, we got to be there. So please, folks, all of that is online. You can go to patreon.com slash politics done right. Again, that is patreon.com slash politics done right. Please support it. I don't only talk about supporting these things with small contributions. I do it myself. I'm a subscriber to the coffeepartyusa.com. I'm a subscriber to dailycoast.com. I'm a subscriber to democraticunderground.com. I'm a subscriber to opednews.com. I'm a subscriber to my local party, uh, uh, local independent party, and subscriber to, to, to my, my local clubs and many others. Why do we do this? In the progressive space, one of the things that we have problems with is supporting the people who are out there trying to make things better. We cannot make things better if the other side is well-funded. If they're well-funded, they can get things done because they're well-funded. We work on meager budgets, but we know what's right, and that's what we try to do. In my case, I gave up an entire company, and, and, and as people would sit down and say, oh, but the company must have been dying while you gave No, it was not. I made the conscious effort after my daughter was done with college 
to really start and doing what my passion is, and that is the passion to get something done politically to make things better for us all. That is what it's all about. I couldn't believe just I I couldn't just live that capitalist life of thinking about one's self only. I wanted to do more, and that's what I'm doing. Patreon.com slash politics done right. We earn we earn your support. We earn your contribution. We provide you value. We provide this country value. So please consider becoming subscribers of Politics Then Right. Folks, the telephone number is 646-716-5812. Come on back in, my friend, Mike. Yes, sir. I appreciate you always in it because we have political alliance together and uh, we understand the pain and misery of the United States citizens and we want to make uh, United States better for everyone. Absolutely. Uh, regardless of income, uh, income or less income, everyone. We are not going to only say make America great for, uh, you know, for certain people who support uh, Donald J. Trump, my friend. And Venezuela President Carlos Maduro is blaming U.S. cyber attacks for catastrophic lights out situation that Venezuela now finds in itself in. And uh, we know that it had a, a Pentagon code name Nitro Zeus, as I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they have agenda to attack uh, and recapture like what they did to Panama and uh, Granada. I mean, now Venezuela because of oil only, nothing else. Any country has uh, oil in the world will never ever find happiness and uh, or even if they come close to happiness, they mess things up. They say, no, you have to go. We bring somebody else instead of you. I mean. As long as they have oil, no democracy, no uh, peace and tranquility for their citizens at all. And no. at zero hedge, uh, go ahead. Sir. No, no, go, go ahead, ahead, sir. Go ahead. My friends. Finish, finish. Yeah. Uh, as zero hedge reported this uh, recent uh, story, a new World War Three stimulation by, uh, you know, the tank rand as. Uh, found that the global war between U.S. and Russia and China together, U.S. get its ass uh, handed to it, according to RAND analyst David Uchmanek, mm -hmm. who made sure to uh, mince his words. But so we can officially stimulate with RAND uh, finding that anybody within U.S. military government is still pushing for war with Russia and China, uh, you know, who wants complete destruction of America. Go ahead, please. Right. Well, look, Mike. thank you so kindly, Mike, for uh, calling in. We're at the end of the show. Uh, folks, uh, again, I'd like to urge you to support Politics Done Right at patreon.com slash politics done right. Uh, going back to Venezuela, I want to tell my Venezuelan friends, I understand. For those of the, my more, uh, my more well-to-do Venezuelan friends who are of the middle class, I understand. But, on, but what I would like them to understand as well is one of our goals have to be for all. And it is a, a lot of the stories that are being spun right now just aren't true. Math is absolute. The fact that from the, t from the beginning of the, the, the oil being found in Venezuela, very few people were able to take advantage of those spoils presents a case that it has always been corrupt, whether it is under uh, Maduro or it was under Carlos Andres Perez, their former uh, president several times over, who went to jail, in fact. So let's, let's be clear. Uh, let's consider the people going forward. Uh, tomorrow I'll be speaking to the Colombian ambassador. Uh, should be bringing that live to, to, to everybody here. 
And uh, I, I have a feeling, I don't know what his position is with respect to Venezuela, though I can almost guess what it is, given what a, some of the countries like Panama, Colombia, and others, and Brazil feel about uh, Nicolas Maduro. But I'd love to hear his part and give him a chance to speak to the whole population, because that's what we are for here, free speech. Folks, my name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. Thank you so kindly for having spent this hour with me. You guys have a wonderful day, and you know how I close this baby. I am out. Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is the progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, conservative, or otherwise, you get to air your point of view. Remember, you can also send me a tweet to E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willie. Let us engage. It is politics done right. One, two, three, four.